So I'm Flora Samuel, I'm Professor of Architecture in the Built Environment in the New School of Architecture at the University of Reading and I also lead on research for the Royal Institute of British Architects. So that means um, I'm really, really obsessed with supporting research in practice. Uh, yeah, I've got this title, RIBA Ambassador for Innovation. And this funny picture here floating around is by a PhD practitioner who's working with me at the moment, Gillian Horn, trying to work out how you separate elements of houses and uh, think about uh, how people respond to, in terms of taste and feeling of home and things like that. Because um, I'm sure, as you all will know by now, housing and home is the most incredibly difficult subject to research. So, if I can get this working. Oh, it's that way around. No? Mm -hmm. Am I doing it right? What do I point at? Maybe the battery's gone. Uh -huh. <laughs> ah, to turn it on. That's a good start. <laughs> okay. Oop. Oh, yeah, there we are. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my own personal methodology. Um, I think it's really important to say where you're coming from so that you can work out for yourself the things that I'm leaving in to the account and the things that I'm leaving out. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my view of the global research context for, for housing. Uh, housing studies as a field and then get on to the subject of research skills and uh, the things that I think PhD st students need to know. Knowledge, and then I'm going to look at one case study thesis on the subject of d good density. Uh, good density is an area that's becoming very a hot topic nowadays. This is, uh, I was in Korea uh, in January, this is the smart city of Songdo, which is near the airport. And as you can see from it, it has eight lanes of traffic. Uh, and I really don't think it's very smart. Um, some of the buildings have got this well or Briam rating for sustainability, but all the towers that you see behind it are these horrible kind of towers that Leandro uh, have referred to, the kind of things you get in Hong Kong. So I think this whole smart city agenda, oh, the whole urban agenda is, is enormously complex. So my methodology, you need to know where I live. I live here. This is where I live in Wales, in Cardiff. This is um, a party for the Queen's birthday. Now, we, aren't, we don't really care about the Queen very much, but uh, it, an excuse to have a party anyway. And I, have a, I blame these Queen parties for the reason that um, Britain is leaving the European Union, because the referendum happened about a week later. If we were feeling very patriotic, you know, it was not a good thing. But um, I feel very lucky because I live in a community. How many of you feel you live in a community, your home, where your home is? That somewhere where you could cross the road to ask your neighbour for a cup of sugar. Any anybody think they live in a community? Yes. Mm. Three or four. Because, I mean, that's a fairly. I often ask this question, and I would say maybe about 15% of people live in communities. So my aspiration is community, uh, and my, my fantasy and my utopia uh, is, is community. Uh, just uh, you know, in which uh, a diversity of people can live um, happily. And of course, terrace houses are absolutely the standard building type for, the, for Britain. And at the rate that we are going, keeping on building at the moment, people are going to have to live in terrace houses in 300 years' time. So I keep imagining spacemen in these Victorian houses. It's just crazy. Uh, a, a terrible housing crisis in, well, all over the world, but in Britain. So this, I took a photograph of the, this I took in Reading, where I work. Um, yesterday um, and I was amazed because the homeless are starting to set up their tents in the street <laughs> you know and actually informality which is a very big subject in this global dwelling area is coming to Britain big time where homelessness is becoming really acute I should say it was 37 degrees in, in Britain yesterday as well, so we are really, global warming is kicking in. So these are things that get me exercised. So I'm interested in the scholarship of integration. I like joining up fields that don't normally come together. And I really do believe that architects are much, more, much too inward looking. 
Is everybody here an architect? Is anybody not an architect or not from an architectural background? Yay. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I hope you understand what we are saying. <laughs> because architects um, tend to hang out together, so we try and get out of it. Uh, participatory action re research is the way I usually work, getting out there, doing stuff with people. Um, I really believe that theory needs to be put to work in the field. Just talking over lunch, uh, there are a great many PhDs which are very obscure and don't seem to be about impact. And personally, I think that in this world where there's such terrible global challenges, I think we need to have PhDs that uh, can be useful. But if you're working in the field of global dwelling, that's what they should be. I'm strongly influenced by the French Marxist sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, ideas about taste and distinction. But the same, I, can't, I, find it I still love really good buildings, <laughs> and I find it difficult to resolve the two. I think there's room for some resolution needs to happen. Um, and I came across this uh, terminology recently, eudaimonic well-being. You know, we all want well-being, we all want to be happy, but eudaimonic well-being is even better than well-being. And eudaimonic well-being is uh, well-being when you feel that what you do and your life serves a greater purpose outside of yourself. It's not just about me, it's about a greater purpose. And uh, I like this terminology because I think, and it makes, and it fits in with my ideas about pedagogy. Um, so I'm very interested in this guy, Biesta, who wrote this book, The Beautiful Risk of Education. And he says the whole point of education and of pedagogy is the task of the educator to keep education open for the moment when we are called, in which we are singled out, in which we are assigned to take responsibility for our responsibility. So it's the task of the educator to support another person to have that moment when, they, when their life kind of makes sense. Uh, and sometimes it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. But I think the best chance of making that happen is when you work in live projects in the real world. Um, so this is Live Works at Sheffield University, which we set up when I was head there. And it's, an, it's a disused shop, which is a, a, a kind of urban room for um, the community, academia, and industry to work together and to explore issues. And it is in these real world contexts that I think students will discover their, who they really are. So uh, yeah, my, these kind of design studio work that, that um, I've done in the past is very much about working with people, which is a very difficult thing to do and doesn't often happen in architecture schools. So that's the background on me. So what are you learning when you do a PhD? I mean, one of my things about trying to be um, uh, an academic who integrates knowledge across different fields. I believe that architects need to say with great clarity what it is they do. And if we can say with clarity what we do, it's easier for other people to engage with us. And it's easier for us to say, we have value because we do this. And I'm writing a book about this. I've been writing a book for five years now on this subject. And I've got to finish it because I could carry on writing it forever. But uh, at the same time, I like to try and be clear about what it is we uh, you know, try to make. That's why I like Leandro's uh, structure diagram, and I like it when people make taxonomies. Somebody said they were doing a taxonomy. I like that because we need these structures. They're always provisional. They're always something to be critiqued. But unless we try, we can't really uh, move on. So, um, yeah, oh, these are... I think my, my qualification for being here is that Sheffield has the biggest cohort of PhD students in Britain. It has over 100. And within that, we had over 25 people who, when I was there, who were working within the field of home and home research and housing. And we used to have these very lively and interesting debates around uh, the field. So they're the home research group getting to work on the subject. But what are you learning? I mean, I, I think you're learning to be a professional. You're learning to be a research professional, and that's an, a subset. Well, it's not really a subset. I think all architects should be research professionals in actual fact. Um, you're learning research skills, you're learning not, you get developing knowledge, and you're develop, I think you should be developing a very critical attitude to ethics. Now, um, 
In order to be a profession, you need to have an ethical stance. And I think that one of the reasons that architecture as a profession is so marginalised and poorly respected, certainly in the UK, is because it lacks an ethical dimension. It doesn't, it seems to be self-serving. It's not helping the public. This little picture is of a very interesting journal that came out in the 1970s, Architectural Research and Teaching. It only came out for a very, very short time, but it, it, it really includes some fascinating explorations about these, how these issues might come together. The other one is risk. I think, we need to, I, uh, I think we need to talk about risk all the time. I we were talking about risk with Georgia's um, <coughs> uh, presentation earlier. Um, for clients, risk is everything. How can we minimise risk? They don't want risk at all. Uh, and research reduces risk. But you also need to think about risk in terms of your own education. You made a huge commitment to do a PhD, many of you. Costs a great deal of money. How are you going to make sure that works for you? How are you going to reduce the risk going forward? And as we know, if you've read anything by Helga Nowotny, who's a fabulous writer on risk, if you reduce risk in one area, it pops up somewhere else. Um, risk is a very fascinating subject and I think um, something we have to take hold of. So perhaps the most important thing that we can teach students is how to respond to uncertainty and change and how to themselves become resilient. So we're making this new school of architecture and what I'm arguing, or we are arguing, is that we're ed educating students to become, um, we're giving it, so they're learning how to deal with change. Not so much about architecture, uh, although there's some specific architectural schools in there, but it's how to be resilient. And how to be resilient involves having research skills, I would argue. And more and more architectural practices are getting very, very strategic about research because that they see this is the future, especially for small practices. The very large ones are going to be absorbed by giant, giant Chinese uh, construction companies. The ones in the middle, I don't know what's going to happen to them, the very small ones are going to become very specialised. I really like this, uh, this is uh, a studio, it's a practice in London, about 20 people. If you go into their reception, they have their research timeline on the wall uh, going up to 2050 and they're working with Rachel Armstrong at Newcastle University who works in growing the DNA of DNA architecture. So. You know, they're taking their control of their own destiny, and I think it's important that um, you guys do that. To be a resilient researcher, you need to be very strategic about your research topic and methodology and ensure it's a subject of great personal importance to you and that it can have impact, I would argue. Otherwise, it's going to be quite difficult and difficult to last the course. And I put this up. This is uh, somebody sent me this. Um, it was a research director in a very large architecture practice. And she said, I'm hoping you can help by suggesting someone who could put me into contact with someone who might know a potential candidate. Ideally, the person would have a degree in the built environment or social sciences. Most importantly, they need to think analytically, big picture and write clearly. We're looking for five years plus of research experience. So that's what architecture firms are starting to employ as researchers. And I so value what you're learning here. It's very important. So, global research context, a little bit, well, and I would love it if, I mean, many of you will know much more about it and in different directions, but this is the global research context for uh, in research in housing as far as I know it. And I was talking with one of the people here about hutongs, um, here's a lady going off to get her water, living in a very traditional Chinese courtyard house in, in Harbin in northern China. But a fantastic environment, apart from the fact it doesn't have water. Uh, but these are things going, you know, pressing problems. Now, Horizon 2020, 80 billion euros went out for research. A lot of it directed at SME, small to medium sized enterprises. But I have not yet found an architecture practice that got any Horizon 2020 funding, apart from Norman Foster's office. Do you know anybody? Anybody know any? No. You do. You know? Well, I don't know. No, offices, exactly. So we just failed. The profession failed uh, uh, um, on, on that one. But, so we've really got to up our game in, in terms of accessing these kind of fundings. And in Britain now, this is the funding area, uh, the Global Challenges Research Fund. And, and urbanism and dwelling and ageing populations and all the things we're discussing here are right at the top of the research agenda. 
And this guy is a guy, Michael Keith, from Oxford University. When all the res Britain takes its money out of Europe, it's going to be putting them into an interdisciplinary research pot, which is that grey area, that big fat grey area. And that is going to be, so there's commitment to 100 million or so more funding in UK, and it's all going to go to cities research. So there was one call that came out recently around this area. So it's just going to grow and grow. Um, housing studies as a field. Well, ah, this, these are the terrible houses that we um, in Britain put up with, which nobody really wants, but there's no choice in housing. Um, so there's a global housing crisis. There's a crisis everywhere about uh, um, lack of housing and lack of choice. So uh, I'm, we, I'm part of a £6 million research consor consortium, um, the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence, the Housing Value Evidence Centre. And this is with universities all across Britain, and we're going to be collecting evidence about um, affordability, not just financial affordability, but all other kinds of affordability. What is really affordable? What does that mean? And this is a, well, a potential co collaborator with the Oikonet, I would, I would suggest. So we haven't really started on that. You can watch this space. But uh, I do recommend, it's really, really, these sort of literature review papers are really, very helpful to try and get some sense of the picture. And you're always going to need your literature review bit at the beginning of your PhD that sets out your research context. And think of the kind of journals where you might want to publish. I mean, there's a whole range of different journals in housing studies. These are some of the ones that uh, I respect, but none of them are, have much input from architects. In fact, architects are pretty much invisible from the housing research debate, I would say. And yeah, pretty much invisible. So the UK Housing Evidence Centre consortium, I'm the only architect on it only person interested in design, all the other 25 members are economists and planners. And what have we done to get become so marginal from the whole debate discussion of the home? The problem is, I think, that we don't speak the same language and people don't believe the language that we speak. So, I mean, other really significant players on this whole housing territory are, of course, UN Habitat. I mean, I'm sure people can mention a few others. And these are important folk, if you're applying for research funding, that you need to get a letter of support from. So I was very grateful when I went to an Oikonet event and met someone from the UN Habitat, because these are, these, these are significant people to connect with. Have any of you been to an ENHR conference? European, and, well, um, how many architects were at that? You laugh. <laughs> these are absolutely massive, these conferences. I would say there are 500, 600 people coming to them. Huge, great parallel recessions. Maybe there are four architects, I would say. And so you go and I think, I'm going to get interdisciplinary. I'm going to talk about my stuff. You go and give your paper, and there's a total silence, uh, in my experience. <laughs> and because you're just coming from a different planet as far as they're concerned. And we have to go in and get involved with talking their, their, their language. So I think this is my list of hot topics. I'm sure you'll have a very different, different list. Uh, let's think of some more. Affordability, not just money. Well-being, sustainability. Housing supply chains. As things go straight from the digital design to the manufacturer, that's going to be a big territory. Choice. There's very little choice. Self-build, uh, informality, housing and ageing population, off-site manufacturing. Well, they're doing really well on that in places like um, Scandinavia. In Melbourne, they've, in Melbourne, in Australia, they've built three new off-site housing manufacturing factories in the last year. I mean, where are the future of houses going to be? I mean, these guys are making systems that will be imported all over the world, like IKEA. And if you're in a country like mine, we're going to be completely left behind. Digital construction, intelligent housing that's responsive to g gadgets and gizmos, but big data, how we collect big data uh, the, around the housing and home. Um, has anybody got any subjects you think I've radically missed out on? There are many more, but these are the ones that are big near me. Um, so what research skills do you think you might be learning? Um, 
you know, think, learning to think about methodologies, thinking about critical thinking and representation. These are things I'm going to talk about a little bit. And last of all, this ethic issue again, which I keep discussing. So methodologies, Carla specifically wanted me to bring this issue up, and it is a difficult one. I think that we do, uh, architects, um, I think you know, I teach history and theory where I work. I think it should be called history and methodology, because theory, in essence, in architecture is, is methodology. The distinct research methodology of architects, I believe, is architect, is design studio. We do this all the time, we do this in our, you know, from year one we do design studio. And if you go and look at architecture from the from this perspective of organisational management studies or STMS, I can't even remember what that stands for, all these sort of managerial processes, they're writing about studio um, as an organisational process with a boundary object, which is, or artefact of knowing as it might be, which is the model or the drawing or whatever is in the middle of the debate. And other fields are stealing this process. And no, most notably management, uh, Stanford University, um, ethnographers and so on. This is something that we're really, really good at, but we don't make enough of it. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet now about design thinking, and it costs a lot to employ uh, an agency to do some design thinking for you. But architects do, do design thinking all the time. So where, how have we been so... How have we managed to not sell ourselves properly and to get across how clever we are? And what is distinct about architecture? I, I believe that the distinct thing about um, architectural design studio as opposed to say product design or something is that we work at different scales simultaneously. Uh, and I don't know if you've read Yaneva who works in Manchester University's work about um, researching OMA's office. There's something very distinct about architects that they work in different scales and they think about huge great integrated systems all the time and of course they think about buildings. But we need to get across what's, what's special about us. Now, um, so I, architecture does have its own research methodologies and the EAA made out a manifesto about uh, what architectural research is, but we need to make them really, really explicit. And why have I got to, anybody know which building she's licking? Yes? Well, she's licking the Barcelona pavilion. Um, <laughs> why did I put that there? I suppose I put it there because I think that the best research tool that any of us has is our own body. And that the feelings that we have and the instincts that we have, you shouldn't ever forget that. But you can make a methodology about anything, really. Uh, methodology can be about building, construction, whatever. And this tiny diagram that you can't see typical research article structure. I think whatever, however you go about doing your uh, research, you, you must frame it in the normative terminology of research, which is uh, methodology, findings, uh, results, literature review, because those, that's what other fields understand. So if your work is being assessed or discussed by anyone coming from another field, they won't understand it if you don't have this normative frame, framework. And architects don't like those normative frameworks. So as Jeremy Till says, if architectural research is to develop in power and reach, it must be made explicit and communicable to others in normative formats that translate across disciplinary boundaries. So I don't know if ever as, uh, I find architectural writing very, sometimes can be very difficult to understand and get into. Um, and students are very seduced by this kind of architectural writing that's not very clear. But, and that is one of the things that's really not helping the profession, this thing archi speak. So what is methodology? Can't even see from here. A system of ways of doing. There's nothing magical about methodology. It's just a system of thinking, values and so on. Um, so please don't be scared of it. I find people are really scared about methodology. So methodology is the ideological foundation for the, for the methods that will then be used to unpack the research. It's the background uh, uh, to the, so say, um, I was trying to think of an example from earlier today, but I think I wouldn't want to put pe words into people's mouths. So, which is method and which is methodology? Can anyone like to have a go? A survey of taste preferences in homeowners based on the French Marxist sociologist Pierre Bourdieu's theories 
as set out in his book Distinction. Would anyone like to... Any, maybe it's easier to find the, the method. Can anybody say what the method is there? The way that the research has been done? Survey. survey, exactly, survey. So, and what would be the methodology then? What's left behind? Marxist yeah, the Marxist sociologists, exactly. Um, but that takes... Not everyone, it takes quite a while to get that. So the survey is the method, it's the way you're going to do it. But the methodology, and other people, you please argue with me if I got it wrong, I, um, it's quite possible. <coughs> the methodology is the kind of ideology, the backdrop to the way you do it. So don't be scared of methodology, uh, uh, whatever you do. Um, and we, we wrote this book, Demystifying Architectural Research, with a specific uh, specifically to, to support practitioners in doing their research. So, hope, so it's got 26 practitioner case studies of research. And we describe what people do in practice in terms of aims, methodology, and the normative headings to try and translate for practitioners what they do into a research language. So, for example, if you're a tiny practitioner, there's one example, Jane Burnside. She's a one-woman practice in Northern Ireland. She does bespoke houses for individual clients. She has a very, very nice way of working with them to elicit what they want, where they gather information and they make uh, Pinterest, pin boards of material and so on. And she's developed this over 20 years. So she's got a very sophisticated methodology, or me well, method, you would say, I suppose. Her, her background methodology is around trying to empower the people by letting them have, uh, um, bring forth their own tastes. Colour, I bought you a copy of this book, but I didn't bring it with me today. <laughs> uh, but I really like that because it really shows that the most nitty-gritty basic practitioner work is actually research. So um, here are some housing, you really can't read them, How different kinds of housing related research methodologies. Design research, working out, making new knowledge through design, participatory action research, doing stuff with people, uh, space syntax digital modelling, um, it's a digital format for showing where, how people move around. Uh, public life studies, studies, Yang Gale, many of you must be familiar with him. Economic models, and within economics I learned that there's classical economics, welfare economics, all different kinds of economics. But you, and there are people, economists making assumptions about architecture, which I'm sure are completely wrong. That's why we've got to get close to economists. Social return on investment, that's one I'm very excited about. This is a way of monetizing social value. And it's very, very participatory. It's much better than it sounds. Environment and behavior, evidence-based research. Uh, what other things? Life cycle analysis. And that's not just in terms of energy. It can be social, it's like how you examine a building from beginning to end, what jobs it created, what learning happened. This is growing. Digital construction. Ethnographic observation, anthropological walks, Sarah Pink is somebody who does those. Uh, material culture, Elizabeth Shove, Daniel Miller, people who show how stuff makes a difference to your life. Visual cultures, phenomenology, we talked about Heidegger earlier on. Information studies, conservation theory, tour, the tourist gaze, the value of the way that tourists looks at things and what the economics that brings to people. There's tons of methodologies. I mean, many, many, but just, you know, go on and on. The thing is to find the one that suits you. And in order to find the methodology that suits you, you have to be able to think critically. And somebody mentioned earlier uh, Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the, of the Oppressed, uh, which is really the book about encouraging critical thinking, how vitally important it is to learn how to think for yourself. I got this, so it's absolutely tiny, and it says what critical thinking is, but I'm sure you know that it's about looking at stuff and making your own decisions. It's really, really important to support PhD students or support anyone or support yourself in becoming a critical thinker, to, um, which, is, which is why I um, try to say where I'm coming from at the start of doing lectures, because it's very, very good for your life chances, ultimately. And a good way to start with critical questions are who, what, where, why, when, and how. 
what's been left out, what's, what's going into the account that we're giving. So critical thinking is about learning to make sense of the barrage of the information that we're confronted with. It's about being aware about the tacit prejudices and assumptions within accounts of the world. It's about constantly looking for what's been left out of the account. And if something is left out of the account, is it justified? Um, it's also about admitting to your own subjectivity and its impact on information. So I'm very fond of uh, this piece of writing, Situated Knowledges by Donna Haraway. And if I'm ever examining a PhD and it, the, the researcher pretends that they are an objective sort of, it could be said that, or they pretend that there's some objective distance from the research, I would always want a preface that actually situated their knowledge so you could see where they were coming from because there's no such thing as objective. I've sat in a room of scientists in Imperial College in London and they say that they write up their experiments in the first person. I did this, I did that. Because they recognise this important subjectivity impacts on their research. Now there are still fields, so for example in planning, if you write, write to a planning journal and you say I did this, I did that, it's going to get thrown out. There's still some fields that just will not let you work in the first person. Um, but I think it's really important to be clear about where you're coming from. And this sort of thinking comes from Donna Haraway. Representation. You need to ha learn how to represent your ideas. And there's so many different ways of doing it. I mean, one thing that architects are really good at is tiny little diagrams. And I do reckon, uh, recommend any PhD student, if you don't know how to do it, to go and learn InDesign or something so that you can do infographics that will completely blow everybody else away. Design is, um, uh, is of course, a very valid way of doing a PhD. Um, so in those situations, instead of an 80,000 word thesis, you might write a 40,000 word thesis with, a, with, a, with a, uh, a, a drawing portfolio on the side. There are some places where, I think like RMIT in Melbourne, where they're trying to argue for art-based architecture PhDs with no words. But I think that the majority of architecture-based folk believe that writing is a really a key part of our discipline. Um, so um, if you, this is a, a good book to look at, Expanding Disciplinarity in Architectural Practice by Tom Holbrook. This is by a PhD by a practitioner, a really, really excellent practitioner. And his PhD came out of, um, so I, want, I, I bring that up there to show this, uh, well, uh, what I believe is that writing and design are very, very closely linked. In fact, you can't think of them as separate at all. Both have a structure, a language and a syntax both the ways of modelling and exploring ideas. And there are all sorts of people who explore ways of writing within architecture. Jane Rendell's sight writing is a famous, famous example, building on the work of Katja Grillner and people in KTH. I, on this side, there's Nisha Awans. She won a, um, an RIBA medal for um, this piece of work, Margin, Marginal Spaces Constructing Othering Home. I, c I wish I could bring a, a page up showing uh, a page from this thesis, but what's very nice about it is has, it has very the scientific language of her research subject juxtaposed with her very subjective account. So it's about being a Bangladeshi in immigrant, and then she has the subjective account of her mother, how her mother is sitting there cooking as a Bangla Bangladeshi uh, immigrant in, in, um, in England, her feelings and so on. So they're juxtaposed next to each other, they're very two different viewpoints, but um, there are many ways of writing. So I, but you should be aware of this program, the Adapter program, uh, which um, Johan Verbecker, who is key to Oikonet, uh, set up. Uh, it's a collaboration with um, RMIT in Australia. And it was a five, I think in my five million euro program which enabled practitioners to do practice-based PhDs. So it's really kick-started the whole practice-based PhD thing. Ethics. Now, if you do, in my university, if you're a first-year architect and you're doing anything that goes anywhere near people or talking to a person, you have to fill out an ethics application and you have to learn how to be an ethical practitioner. Now the problem is that these kind of ethical applications are really, really 
onerous and they set out a situation at where you are the researcher and the thing that you're talking about, that, you know, the people you're talking to are like kind of laboratory mice. And uh, you, if you are working in a place like, say, Georgia is working in the Philippines, it, you know, if she put a bit of paper saying, can you sign this to say that I've told you about my research project and that you know you're in a research project and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I'm imagining the people she would hand that bit of paper to would say, you've got to be joking, what is this? You know, it's very, very hard to work within university ethics procedures in tricky situations. Now, there are other people like, um, who have, are critiquing this whole ethical thing that we have to do. Ethical challenges of co-production. So, some very interesting research, uh, this is by Professor Kate Paul at Sheffield, um, that gets into the fact that it's really, really, to do this very top-down, very, very uh, formulaic research applications, absolutely get in the way of the fact that you're working together. So, in nearly all universities, you'll be expected to do ethics applications. You may have to do several ethical applications. Um, I think it's something that we need to get critical, and critically engaged with, and get uh, creative with, with as well. I have a practitioner, Gillian Horn, who's a director of a very good firm, Panora Prasad, in London. If she's doing participatory work in her practice, she doesn't have to do any ethical applications. If she's doing it with the university, she has to go through this whole rigmarole. There needs to be some balancing up with the whole thing. And I just point to, um, and this is the Institute of Chartered Engineers in the UK. They've got an ethics app called Just Say No. Uh, if you, so if you have any dilemma about um, how you do research and ethical dilemmas, you can work through that. But it's all very well, I know, because so much of the construction industry is corrupt and cash in hand and working with bribery, even today. So the UIA, the United International Architects, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of their scientific committee for this big convention in Seoul in September, they may put in every lovely ethical uh, procedure they like, but whether it can ever happen across the, the, the extremely corrupt and difficult construction industry, I don't know. Something to consider when you're doing a PhD. What's the kind of knowledge that you might need? Um, and all these photos are of people debating and thinking about sort of things we've been doing earlier on today. What are the knowledges we need? What are the projects we might do? And, and critiquing each other's work. One really major problem I think we have as a profession in architecture is um, the, the information that people use. I was a part of a focus group at the RIBA and we were looking at what kind of information uh, practitioners use. So, if a practitioner has a problem, where do they go? The most likely place they're going to go is a colleague in-house, Google, if they need to answer a question. Whereas the least likely place any practitioner will ever go for anything is the referee journals. The ones that are full of beautiful cutting edge knowledge and they're not trying to sell you a toilet cubicle. It's a very, very big problem that nobody pays any attention to academic research and we have to do some big work uh, to get over that. But even within our schools, I should imagine that undergraduates in architecture schools very, very rarely go and look in academic papers. But there are more and more coming through which are worth looking at and more and more open access. So we have a problem about knowledge. I took this photograph in a architectural practice in China, but this could be a bookshelf in any practice anywhere. I did a project on, I'm doing a project on the value of architects. I would say that you wouldn't find any evidence of any use whatsoever on the value of architects that you could talk to anyone who wasn't an architect about in any of those books. They're just useless, the way that architects talk about architecture. If you want some information on, um, that might be slightly more useful, you can go to this stuff which is called grey literature. Now, grey literature is this industry kind of documents. I don't know, you know, every country must have its own. I know the BNA uh, in Holland does a lot. These sort of documents are constantly being chucked out by professional associations and so on. And they're the most up-to-date and uh, um, useful documents. 
The thing is that they may not be very rigorous. Quite often they're not. And there are not documents that you will ever find in a university search for information. But if you're working in the world of global dwelling, it's these documents that you need to be looking at. Grey literature. And there's even a book on grey literature. So boring is that. But nobody's ever really looked at the grey literature of uh, the field of housing. Well, there's another one. I mean, there are endless ones of these. So the kind of knowledge you need, probably, for doing a PhD in global dwelling are these things, the, the refereed journals. But unfortunately, not many of the refereed journals are really engaging with design issues. And there are very few that are, um, relate to architecture. And the ones that relate to architecture are extremely low impact. Um, so, yeah. You have to be careful when you're writing a PhD you know, because maybe if your subject is very current, you may end up having to refer to information from the industry press. And the industry press is totally unreliable and very, very lightweight uh, evidence. Very often architects use round table conversations. If they have a problem, they get a bunch of architects to talk about it. This has no credibility whatsoever, I would argue. Very, very little. Although it's a, it is a way of starting a conversation in a field where there's no research whatsoever. So the kind of knowledge you use is, is important. And I have to plug again, Leandro, uh, this website, Oikonet, is a wonderful place to start finding about the knowledge of um, global dwelling. And I know this because I was the reviewer for the project, so I actually looked very closely at some of the documents and some really, really gold dust stuff in there. So do go and have a look round if you haven't. So uh, literature reviews. Um, I bring the literature, you, everyone will do a literature review. This is part of a literature review that I did, we did for the Cultural Valley of Architects project. Um, and these were a literature review of great industry documents on value. The reason it goes up is with polit different political regimes, these political regime labour under Tony Blair liked design, then the Conservatives got in, bang, and then nothing happened. Um, and you could, it follows a timeline pattern. But it's very good if you can be as systematic as possible with your literature review. Say what dates it's between, uh, say um, the terminology you're looking at, just even if it's an evolving terminology as you go along. Literature review should always be thematic. And there's a theory of literature reviews, and some very good papers on it. Do check it out. So a literature review is not a random thing. All, uh, and knowledge is fluid and constantly changing, so you really need to acknowledge that temp temporal dimension to the things that you're looking at. I, my literature review was from 2000 to 2016, and maybe you gave it a political context or something else um, when you're doing that. So, and remember that words change over time. The word practice has changed a lot. So, literature reviews, take care with them. Knowledge is needed for a PhD. I would say, well, a general knowledge about the field of housing, specific and a constantly updated knowledge about your own specialist subject, knowledge of the research process, and that's not rocket science. You need, perhaps more than anything, you need to know about time management. Um, what's going on here? Um, uh, sorry, it's a duplicate. And the last one, I would say, how to manage your supervisors. <laughs> really, really, you have to manage your supervisors and make, um, it's your PhD, it's not theirs. Um, so, what's this going on here? What is this thing? When you get into a PhD viva, they say, what is your substantial contribution? What is your contribution to knowledge? I found this slide on the in internet, so you know, what is the substantial contribution? The thesis made a significant and substantial contribution. Whatever you do when you're writing a PhD, tell us what the substantial contribution is. If you're writing an academic referee journal paper, tell us what the substantial contribution is. Make it easy for your examiners, make it easy for your reviewers. But it's a very contested area. Um, in order to show what your substantial contribution is, you need to set out your research context. And in many cases, reapplying an old methodology to a new situation can count as a, as a contribution, but maybe not a substantial one. Um, the PhD is not your life's work. It just shows you know how to research. And what constitutes a good enough PhD is highly contested. Some examiners will just think, oh, a 40% pass is a good enough PhD. Other examiners will be, will be going for perfection. 
take great care with the kind of examiner you go for. So I'll just finish by looking at one case study. And this is a bit unfair on her, but at least it's publicising her thesis. Claire Harper. Claire Harper did a PhD on density at the University of Westminster with Jeremy Till as her supervisor. Investigation into the spatial implications of density for the design of new urban housing. And it's on the internet, well, I can give anyone the reference, it's worth looking at. Um, and as I was the examiner, um, I'm sure none of, it's so tiny, I'm sure none of the things that I say would come as any news to Claire. This is the contents page, it's so small I had to read it out, I think. This is one of my things. Introduction is not at chapter one, please. Everybody puts introduction as chapter one. I get upset by this. If you want, uh, it isn't a chapter one. Chapter one is the first chapter. <laughs> and here it is, an ex exploration of different notions of density through six historical episodes. Chapter two, measuring density, unpacking the units of density and their applications. Chapter three, towards a phenomenology of density. Chapter four, testing the usefulness of a spatial index of density. Chapter five, a reference for the design of higher density housing. Now what is it, I, since you can't see it properly, I was going to ask you to tell me your first impressions of this. Apart from the fact that it's extremely small, and if you're an examiner who's a bit old, you might have a hard time reading it. Um, I would say that it's a very obscure c c contents page, and that really, in an ideal world, Claire would have pulled out very clearly what the methodology was, what the case study was, what was going on. And this is, you know, so that, that, that wouldn't help if she had had a non-architect kind of a examiner going on. I don't know if you read this. So, I'm just picking out little excerpts from this PhD. So, she's making the point that a new methodology is needed, and you're all going to need to make that point in your thesis. Da, 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 da. There's a need, therefore, for research methodology that reflects the range of issues with which designers are concerned and expands on the existing quasi-scientific methods. So, really good thing to do. Set out the context and say what well, new methodology is needed. And in order to do that, you may need to make a survey of the existing methodologies. So, for example, um, Christopher Alexander's methodology, she's surveying that. Uh, She's going through a few of the existing ones. And then she comes to the point, well, I think she might make an error here because she puts some of the existing methodologies in a footnote. These are really important things. Don't put them in a footnote. But she does cover them. So she's covering a range. Uh, so she's looking at Rebecca Tunstall's How Density uh, Affects Residents and Housing. Um, here's another one. She talks about why interviews were not used as part of this thesis, uh, because many researchers had already done that and it's highly subjective. So she sets, the, she sets out the backdrop of methodologies used by other people and, and begins to get into what her own methodology would be, but I would argue Claire could have been a bit more clear about it, but at least all the ingredients are there. So she then set up a new methodology which, you, which is about testing. So she says, the objective of this part of the thesis is to test the proposed spatial conception of density set out in the previous chapter. It draws on design analysis and observation and so on. So at least she's now saying, she gives it, and you must fill your thesis with these headlines. I'm now going to move on to the next stage. I'm going to test the methodology. And then she has a separate thing, which is her methods. The method for testing the indices draws on three types of data and three types of analysis. First, quantitative measurements, detailed design analysis, and I can't find the other one. But these things are gold dust. You must, must, must do them. So that's her method, how she did it, as opposed to the methodology, which I, I found quite hard to find, actually. But one of the useful things, the nice things that Claire did, is she had field notes. She went and looked at these buildings, and she had sketches and drawings. Uh, field notes is a very credible ethnographic way of working, and I would encourage people uh, to, to, to respect them. Uh, she used a design research method, um, a, a design analysis, and to create a series of architectural diagrams. That was part of her method. And then she, after the, she's finished it, she went back and she looked at a method to see if it worked. 
You must, 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 must do this. Your method and your methodology. This is, this is what a PhD is. It shows how you need, need to, how you, you know what a method and a methodology are. You test it and then you review it at the end. So th these are classic bits. And then overall observations. Oh, well, I was going to, I, I shan't ask you for ov overall observations, not least because I'm running out of time, but because you can't see it very well. My overall observation about um, um, Claire's PhD, which is a really good one, but is that it could have been much more clear. And it could have been uh, written in a more normative language, which would have made it more accessible to non-architects. So we're all learning as a field on how to do PhDs. Um, not many PhDs in architecture are very, very rare. Well, in the 1950s, they only began around then. And there were some notable people who got them at that time. Um, but as we all know, in order to have a teaching career now, you probably have to have a PhD. So that was a case study. Say what the methodology is in the introduction. Ideally, you should allude to it in the title. That's helpful. Critically review all the existing methodologies used to tackle your research question or variants on your research question. Develop your methodology, building on a review. I'm sorry this is dry, but it's nitty-gritty stuff. And at the end of the thesis, review the methodology. Not rocket science, but it's important. And suggest improvements for further research working forward. So, in conclusion, um, on this subject, integrating research and pedagogy in the field of housing studies, I'm not sure if I've managed to integrate them very well, but my, my, my uh, underpinning thing is to encourage students to get critical and take charge of their own research. Pedagogy and the beautiful risk of education. Writing a PhD should be a journal, journey of self-discovery, I would argue. And a PhD in housing should contribute to your eudaimonic well-being, to your sense of serving a higher purpose, giving something to society. Okay, that might be, some of you might think that's overly idealistic, but why would you write a PhD otherwise? And this is why it needs to build on your existing skills and interests. It needs to scaffold on what you already know, because that way you'll be passionate about it and you're going to do the best job you ever can do. And this is also why you need time for reflection. And this is why it's so important to manage your time to have another kind of life. And I put that face from the Athens Museum there just to remember your body. Your body is the conduit of your research. So your research needs to be based on your personal values. So a PhD is more about developing skill and confidence in constructing a rigorous argument than it is about knowledge of the subject itself, I would argue. And others, you can tell me I'm wrong. So it's a really, really important to be a resilient person in this world, to keep a record of what you've learned along the way, through your CV, through a journal, a portfolio. Sometimes universities make you fill in a training needs analysis. These are actually important. Not, they shouldn't be perfunctory things. It's important to reflect on what you've learned and identify the gaps. And you also, if you possibly can, get an opportunity to teach while you're doing a PhD. Because that's the way you'll learn. It's, unfortunately, it's through teaching that you learn most, <laughs> pedagogically. I mean, that's what people, it's been shown that the best way to learn something is to teach it. So we're all very lucky if we get to teach. It's also about learning to manage your time and allowing yourself time for reflection. So, research in the field of housing studies, housing is obviously a really key global challenge. It's a very, very large chaotic area, as Leandro wonderfully introduced and, and, try, and began to make sense of it. But it's why you have to be clear and focused, because you have to make a watertight argument. Um, and literature reviews are always helpful, as, they, as knowledge is constantly shifting. And you need to say when your literature review was done. Um, and also practitioners res really, really need academic research that helps them make sense of information. So your literature review is always going to be interesting to practitioners. I, I, so knowledge is on the move. Um, it's, everything's changing. Um, but you have to try and be as clear as you can about why you're doing a PhD and why it will change the world. Thank you for your patience. Sorry, it was rather long. <laughs>
Has anybody got any questions or comments or disagreements? Have you been encouraged to think out uh, about your PhD, about what it's going to mean to you in your career going forward? Uh, has that been something on your supervisor's agenda? Because it's really, really important, I would argue. Did I miss any important global research players on my lists? I think it's uh, very comprehensive. I <laughs> hope that they appreciate it, and therefore you have made to clarify what, what a PhD means, but it is very important that they are aware, if people are serious about it, what does it mean, because uh, it's a real, I mean, those who have experience in, 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 uh, in leading uh, PhDs will always go over the same barriers over and over. I think it's good that uh, students who are involved in a PhD, uh, they are exposed to the challenge they have in front and also the requirements. And uh, there's an agreement in accepting these challenges because sometimes we find situations where people are doing PhD without really knowing what does it mean. And that's uh, something that I think is better to, to avoid. I think your, your exposition I think makes clear what a PhD means in a rigorous serious academic terms. Yes. And that's something to appreciate. And it has to be like this. There's no it has to be like this it has because to be like this. unless we have our architectural PhDs like this, our field carries on being marginal to the whole debate about global dwelling. I, I think that the, the other issue would, uh, I mean, we are also discussing in our school and how to integrate research into the overall, uh, to all the levels of the education, from bachelor to master and so on. So that research does not appear when you say, I want to do a PhD. Yeah. It's just an attitude that is built already from the start. Yeah. That you grow on this skill of research already from the beginning. When you start in school, you enter an environment where knowledge is uh, constructed with rigor. That uh, when you write a piece of paper in the school when you're in the first year, it has to be well written. Um, that you should be looking to the sources, that you should know how to refer to the sources, understand what you're reading, writing properly. This is basic skills that are being systematically ignored. Yeah. And Without these skills, you cannot write any PhD, but I would say you, can, you should not be in the university mm. yeah, from the first level. So I, I think th these kind of things are important because when it comes to the practical, to the practical issue of, you say now at the end, uh, practitioners need uh, the outcomes of the research. They do. This we, have, we, we had a meeting uh, two days ago with uh, another project where we were having a workshop with neighbors in a neighborhood which is under transformation in Barcelona, and they, they asked for that to us say, okay, we are here doing the workshop with you, we answer your questions, but we also want to have the return. We also want uh, you to tell us how do you see our problems from the outside, what are the solutions, what are mm. the problems from analyzing them from the outside. So I think there is a, there's a practical need for doing research in a rigorous way, as you say here, and uh, giving the result back to the community or back to the actual practice. So it's not only an outcome that remains inside academia, but it has a real impact. And that requires the basic skills of writing, of analyzing, of having credibility in what you are doing. When you expose the results, do it as this PhD that you showed mm. up here. You can explain the methodology. You can explain even testing the methodology and telling the results at the end. I think this is very important. Yes, I think because um, I've seen, I've been a design, a, a client advisor on very big building projects and I'm amazed when architects come to pitch their work you know they may have put half a million pounds of money into the, the competition entry but they are terrible at talking about their work in my experience and they could so easily use evidence research evidence and it would immediately has such a magical effect to convince people for um, to, because, because people love statistics and they, well, they love evidence because it's so difficult to understand where the risks are in any kind of project. Um, but I, I think it, certainly in our new school of architecture we're trying to, even from first year, because in schools now in, in the UK, students are being encouraged, school children are being encouraged to cr think critically. And um, 
we're trying to, uh, so for example, in history theory, it's about looking, or, or well, say when they, students go out to analyse the city, they're looking at it through a tools, through a lens, through a particular way of looking at the city, so that's a methodology. Or in the history theory, they're looking at a building through a particular lens. And what I'm looking for is to students being able to overlay the methodology lens onto buildings or whatever they study and to realise how to make a good argument. I mean, more and more practitioners that I meet say we're not so interested in students being able to design, we're actually interested in students who can write because there's so many students who can't write. I don't know if it's like that in the European context. Uh, you know, and, and if you can't write, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm considering putting on remedial writing classes actually because this is something we have to get, we have to get right. Um, well, you know, uh, it's, it's so, so important. But um, I, one thing I didn't have a picture of, and I, I tried to get it from my colleague, is I think there's a really good role to play in doing mind maps of your field. So if you're looking at, say, I don't know, um, any particular area, to brainstorm all the names of all the writers on that all the experts on that area on a piece of paper and then to try and organize them into categories or groups it's something that architects are very good at because they're very visual so it doesn't have to all be about writing and that's why i say infographic diagrams really 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 good way to go but so it's a fantastic way if you show all your field as uh, these names and experts then you can see the gaps in the field and gaps in the field are opportunities for practice actually um, so, for example, we don't, there's a gap of knowledge around how the design of shops impacts on the ability of shops to sell things. Now, if you're a practice who becomes an expert on that area, even a little bit expert, and you say, well, my design did this because it did that, you know, you've got some very serious knowledge to make money with, uh, commercial knowledge. That's just one crude example, but there are many, many more opportunities where um, uh, of things that we, you know, we need to know about. For example, user experience. Um, I think the future of architectural practice, a lot of it will be about taking the client through a, through a journey of learning, a pedagogy, a sort of almost like it's almost like a pedagogical job, and clients will pay for an architect because they want an opportunity to develop themselves and to make a home or something that has an element of their own identity in it. Um, if you go to Norman Foster's office, the experience of the client is choreographed, the way you go up past this beautiful bar with lots of beautiful young people drinking cocktails, and then you go into his studio and there's all these wonderful models, and you go over there, you're given champagne. You know, that's what clever architects are doing. That's, that's a user experience. But the same thing, a user experience with a, with a very unhappy community in, in you know, the Philippines. That's also a user experience. So I hope, I really think that uh, um, um, research needs to be made useful for practice because practitioners have got a very hard job. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Veronica. I do, I think for me, you understood what I, okay. was, I was waiting for. Uh, okay. I think this, is, this information is really important. We have the same problem in our school with writing because we, when we start, we we when we don't have to write anything. So you pass five, you stay here during five years, and probably you will you would able to write better when you were at the end of the school, mm. and you forget because you you don't practice. Exactly. So yeah. Exactly. It's, it's true that then you have to learn again, but when you finish. So it's true that we should uh, practice writing when we when we are here when we yeah. are studying, yeah. and some there are some little experience. I don't know if there were there were. Uh, sometimes he, one year or some years he tried to do this exercise, just making a little essay or a little text about the project about the, and about the, the way someone arrives into one solution in, in a design studio. No? Mm -hmm. To understand the process and uh, practice with the writing. So I think that we, we do that just in an informal way. 
yeah. have to. So at the end, we we lose the capacity or the ability to to write. Yes. Our, our years. Yes. No, and some many, many architects are very scared about writing, actually, and very unconfident about writing. Um, I like the way how you put it, that when you're writing the PhD papers, you actually also want to make it not obscure. Absolutely. Accessible. This is really good advice, because not everybody knows it. They want to pretend it's obscure sometimes. Well, I think that architectural writing is so obscure that you think that you're not writing architecturally if you're not obscure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that, that's the problem, and that's why I put, showed that picture of that bookshelf in China. It could have been in any office, because so many of those books are so obscure. Yeah, but then there was also, um, I read on the Patrick Dunleavy's authorizing PhD, hmm. the, guide, um, the guidebook for general book, like, you just read it when you start. So, basically, there is a diagram, kind of like, in general, how do you act? Uh, assess uh, what is the quality or what, how do you judge it's a good writing. So there is accessibility and the sophistication of the, the language. So basically you have to be accessible and also sophisticated in order to be qualified as a good writing. Mm. So it's very tricky because you want it to be, you want to use the terms, terminologies in the way that it's it's reflecting your literature review, yes. but at the same time, you want to communicate what you already, already processed in order to communicate to the best, to your audience, no matter if it is the examiner or just yes. somebody from another field. Yeah. But it's not really easy to balance between the two as when you practice writing, you notice that like, oh wait a minute, what am I writing? Mm. Oh wait, okay, so maybe I put it that way, but then they lose some 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 content because you rephrased it. Yeah. So I think it needs a lot of practice. I think and also. In the beginning, like no, no, I think you're right. I'm writing a book for practitioners and non-experts at the moment and I'm worried that this will not be considered proper research because of the way I have to use writing. But I mean, all you can do is say in the introduction that this is a specific decision you've made is to write it that way, um, I think. But it's a, that's a really, really good point. And one thing, it, what you said made me think of one thing, is if you're tackling a very big area, you don't have to have the same methodology all the way through. You can have a different methodology for different chapters depending on the kind of air or me uh, methods. To point to. So you might have a, 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 a quantitative survey in this chapter, or um, you might use do a historical chapter, which has got the history of mentalities, the French idea of recreating a sense of the time, going in, in another chapter. You're allowed to have different methodologies, but you need to be in control of them. But thank you for reminding me to say that, because it took me a long time. I, I only learned that. It took me 53 years to learn that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.